Good morning and welcome to PepsiCo's 2022 first quarter earnings question and answer session. Your lines have been placed on listen only until it's your turn to ask a question. In order to ask a question or make a comment, please press star followed by one on your touchtone phone at any time. You may remove yourself from the queue by pressing the pound key. Today's call is being recorded and will be archived at www.pepsico.com. It is now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ravi Pamnani, Senior Vice President of Investor Relations. Mr. Pamnani, you may begin. Thank you, Operator. I hope everyone has had a chance this morning to review our press release and prepared remarks, both of which are available on our website. Before we begin, please take note of our cautionary statement. We may make forward-looking statements on today's call, including about our business plans and 2022 guidance. Forward-looking statements inherently involve risks and uncertainties and only reflect our view as of today, April 26, 2022, and we are under no obligation to update. When discussing our results, we refer to non-GAAP measures, which exclude certain items from reported results. Please refer to our first quarter 2022 earnings release and first quarter 2022 Form 10-Q, available on PepsiCo.com, <clears throat> for definitions and reconciliations of non-GAAP measures and additional information regarding our results, including a discussion of factors that could cause actual results to materially differ from forward-looking statements. Joining me today are PepsiCo's Chairman and CEO, Ramon LaGuarta, and PepsiCo's Vice Chairman and CFO, Hugh Johnston. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question. And with that, I will turn it over to the operator for the first question. Thank you. Once again, in order to ask a question or make a comment, please press star followed by one on your touchtone phone at any time. Our first question comes from Brian Spang with Bank of America. Uh, thanks, operator. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I wanted to ask about margins, and, um, you know, I guess on the last earnings call, it, it, I think the expectation would that margins would be intact, and I guess now with today's guidance, it, it implies maybe a step back in margins. So maybe, Hugh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, maybe how that's changed, um, where we stand now in terms of, like, net inflation as we exit the first quarter, and then what are some of the actions that you're taking, maybe besides pricing, to, to try to protect margins? Yeah, hey, Brian, good morning. Uh, a couple things. One, uh, inflation has clearly gotten a bit more challenging for the year, no, no question about that. It, you know, we, we previously indicated it was low teens. It, it's several points higher than that now. Uh, number two, and, and we've always talked about this in the past, when we have inflation, the first thing we do is look, look internally to try to find opportunities to drive productivity. And, and, you know, we've been pretty good at driving productivity, but we're really stepping it up uh, even a bit further this year, whether it's identifying areas of waste or whether it's uh, looking for to leverage digital in, in a faster and more effective way or whether it's looking to leverage shared services more. And we're, we're obviously doing all of those things. Uh, after that, then, then we obviously uh, look for revenue management opportunities, whether it's uh, the way that we're uh, merchandising product in store or packaging mix or shallowing out promotions, and then obviously price ultimately becomes a factor as well. So um, in, in terms of the overall impact, you know, I, I mentioned that I, I thought margins would be pretty level uh, on the last call. I think by and large that's, that's going to be about the same as, as we go forward. So uh, clearly we'll, you know, we'll decide what we need to do in the balance of the year in terms of, uh, further revenue management actions. Typically, we do that in Q4. But uh, by and large, I think the, the margins will be will be relatively level year over year. Thank you. Our next question comes from Darren Mosesian with Morgan Stanley. Hey, good morning. So on that topic, maybe we can touch specifically a, a bit more on pricing. Obviously, very strong delivery in the quarter. Um, can you talk about consumer demand elasticity so far and what you're seeing? But more importantly, with the cost pressures we're seeing out there, can you talk about strategically how you think about pricing going forward? Is there room to take additional increases if needed? Um, and how you think about that in light of potential consumer sensitivity uh, with in inflation being at unprecedented type of levels? Thanks. Yeah, good morning there. Let me let me take a go and then uh, maybe Hugh can add some comments. Um, clearly, um, obviously, if you look at Q4 and Q1, 
the elasticities that we're having in the business are better than historical and better than what we had planned. So that's why we're we're raising our our guidance for for the year. Um, this is valid both for developed markets and for developing markets. We were very concerned about developing markets, but we're, we're seeing, if you see the numbers in LATAM, in, uh, in Africa, Middle East, and APAC, we're, we're seeing good elasticities there as well. So positive. However, we think the consumer is very early in this process of adjusting to the new inflationary environment. I think there's going to be more consumer new behaviors um, adapting to the uh, to the new realities. There are going to be channel mixes, changes. There's going to be probably packaging uh, mixes, changes, um, and, and, and some other decisions. Consumers will stop doing certain things that we're doing, going out more, um, maybe traveling, and so on. So we think we're early in the process. I think our categories do normally quite well in, uh, in inflationary. And what, what makes us feel... Um, confident is that the uh, the last few years we've invested a lot in the brands um, and we've invested a lot in some new capabilities around you know, revenue management, also understanding better opportunities for waste reduction in the company. And um, we've improved a lot our execution capabilities uh, in the store with more, um, you know, information and, and, and better executional tools. So I, I think we, we feel that we're early in the process. At the same time, we feel rather confident that we can manage through this with a good balance between the revenue management, holistic cost management, and, and our, our number one um, objective is to keep the consumers with our brands. And obviously, if we can get new consumers to our brands even better during this process. So that's how we're approaching this in the short term. And then you were asking about long term. We, we you know These are the goals that we're setting for our teams. You know, we have... I've always said that we have very experienced um, leaders in the market, and this is clearly a battle that you fight market by market, and that gives us, again, a, uh, I think a, a better position to win versus other companies that are facing the same kind of uh, inflation. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add to that, there is if, if you look over time, our categories have always performed pretty well during, during inflationary times. And, and as a result of that, I think as, as a company, our performance has been pretty inflation resistant as, as well as uh, recession resistant, which obviously makes us a, a pretty good defensive stock. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lauren Lieberman with Barclays. Great. Thanks. Good morning. Um, was curious if you could talk a little bit about impacts from Russia, Ukraine that are embedded in the outlook. Of course, saw the um, – impairment charges on, on brands that you talked about, you know, before the, the conflict began, and then also, you know, the charges on, um, on pp and and so on. But I was curious about how Russia-Ukraine is impacting the revenue outlook and also the EPS outlook for the year in terms of operational um, elements. Thanks. Yeah, hi, Lauren. Uh, Russia, is, as I think we've shared in the past, is, is low single digits in terms of its overall size to us. Um, obviously, it's it's a bit of a drag in terms of our our overall outlook, but elsewhere in the company, we're we're doing quite well. So, uh, I think we have a pretty conservative Russia outlook embedded in our guidance, which I think will put us in in good stead uh, for most of the the outcomes that could occur as we go forward. Yeah, and and then with you know with regards to Ukraine. Obviously, we had to stop all our um, operations, their manufacturing operations. We're still doing some sales. That's also impacting. It's also embedded in the in our in our um, uh, guidance for the year. We're uh, we reopen now our factory in Kiev. Um, hopefully, you know we'll try to get back to operations in Ukraine as the safety is, you know situation um, allows us. But that's also embedded into our uh, into our guidance. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bonnie Herzog with uh, Goldman Sachs. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to get a quick clarification on your top line guide based on your comments. So are you now expecting a greater impact from volume growth this year? As you know, you mentioned you're maybe feeling better about elasticities going forward. And then I'd be curious to hear, 
specifically how your immediate consumption business is performing in, in key regions for both your beverage and snack business. You know, I'm, I'm asking in light of, you know, rising fuel prices. Um, you know, for instance, curious to hear if you guys are seeing any signs of pressure in this channel despite, you know, broad reopening in so many markets. And then looking forward, you know, what strategies you have in place to mitigate some of these pressures if they continue to intensify? Thanks. Sure. So, Bonnie, what a nice story. Um, number one, I, obviously, the, the revenue guidance is up. That's a combination of a bit more volume and a bit more price. So, uh, balanced between the two in terms of the change from, from prior. And previously, we had indicated we don't expect much volume growth. So, yeah, I think, yeah, obviously, that takes us to we expect a little bit of volume growth as, as the year progresses. Uh, in terms of immediate consumption channels, we relatively small impact thus far. Um, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, historically, it has impacted the beverage business a bit more than it's impacted the, the snack food business. Uh, I think that's because beverage incidence is just higher than snack food incidence. Uh, but so far, relatively muted impact on, on that. And, and the other channels are, are doing quite well. Uh, yeah, you know, take home is still up big. Gross uh, and and food services growing at a at a nice uh, healthy clip at this point. Yeah, if you think about immediate consumption, the away from home channel is growing very fast across the world and also in the U.S. It's recovering, so that is a positive uh, to immediate consumption. Uh, there's a little bit of traffic decline in convenience stores, but not meaningful at this point. And um, obviously, there the, the strategy will be to gain space and, and gain share in that channel to compensate for whatever traffic dilution might be. Um, also trying to be conscious of, you know, price points and, and entry points to the category in those in those channels. Internationally, <clears throat> we're not seeing, uh, you know, mobility being impacted, and, and we're seeing uh, immediate consumption uh, very strong internationally as well. As I was saying earlier, we're seeing elasticity quite positive in, in, um, in, in emerging markets. So overall, um, I don't think that this is going to impact us in the uh, in the coming period. Thank you. Our next question comes from Andrew Texier with J.P. Morgan. Uh, good morning. Um, I was just trying to um, to check something in between the lines marketing, and I know you had SGNA was up uh, last year. Oh, actually, you were lapping 180 million dollars in equity investment gain from the same period last two years. Uh, but just thinking, as you're mentioning, elasticity is coming in better. Um, obviously, that may change. But what are you embedding for the end of the year in terms of marketing uh, from a dollar and rate perspective? And then for the places where you count on bottlers, was there any impact of stocking this quarter or ahead of price increases? Thank you. Yeah, hey, Andrew. Uh, and I'm up, up roughly in line with revenue for, for the year. Um, so that, that's where that will likely land. Um, yeah, yeah and, and then your question, um, Andrea, on, on the uh, bottlers. No, there, there, is, there hasn't been any, any loading on bottlers uh, for price increase. We, we, don't, we don't follow these practices, neither, neither with uh, our retail partners. So, uh, you, the, you know, whatever you see as sales is basically selling sellouts that we've, we've had for the business. Thank you. Our next question comes from Laurent Grandot with Guggenheim. Hey, good morning, Ramon and you. Um, question on, on PBNA margin. I mean, I've uh, been progressing about 100 basis points in the, in the quarter, almost back to the, uh, the level of pre-COVID for the first quarter, despite, I mean, uh, you know, higher inflation. Could you please um, help share I mean, uh, the impact of the high cost inflation for PBNA specifically in the quarter? And also, could you give us maybe more color as to where the gains are coming from? Uh, maybe uh, the setting between Tropicana divestiture, product mix, uh, and where do we go from here? Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Laura. Uh, a couple of things, obviously, on, on that front. Uh, number one, we, we continue to make progress in terms of cost management inside the business, and, and I've laid out for you all in the past sort of the, our pathway to mid-teams uh, margins for the PB&A business, that, that thesis is still very much intact, and that's, that's the plan we're executing against. Uh, obviously, inflation has put a bit more pressure on that, but the combination of the, the additional cost management actions that we've taken, 
as well as uh, obviously shallowing out promotions and, and price increases and, and revenue management have allowed us to continue on that journey. Uh, we still very much expect to, to do exactly what we've said in the past, which is we'll, we'll progress along towards getting that business back to the, to the margin levels that, that I'd mentioned earlier, something, uh, something in the mid-teens over the course of the next several years. So I think we're making good progress, and, and it's going as we expected. Inflation obviously is, is higher than we expected, but we're taking actions to manage that. Yeah, the, the key levers, uh, Laurent, of, of that um, margin improvement stay intact, right? If you think about the portfolio uh, pivots that we're trying to do, those are really good work in progress. If you, if you saw the, uh, the Gatorade performance, that's a high margin business for us, clearly growing again at a very fast pace. We're making good progress in energy. Uh, so that, that, that part of the uh, transformation is, is good. We're also making good progress on efficiency and operating, uh, you know, excellence. So there, there's, there's the, the critical levers of, uh, of that transformation continue intact. Clearly, inflation is a factor, but as you was saying, we're doubling down on productivity and trying to sharpen the pencil a bit more on, on revenue management as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Vivian Azar with Cowan. Hi, good morning. Um, I was hoping to dive into your European EBIT margins. While I recognize that 1Q is a seasonally low quarter, um, Hugh, I was wondering if you could offer any incremental color on um, the, the margin um, compression that you saw in that segment this quarter. Thank you. Sure, happy to. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, and, and you hit on the key point, it's, it's a very small quarter for Europe. A, a, it's a very short quarter, and, and it's seasonally low in terms of the, the revenue as well. Uh, in terms of some of the factors in, in there, obviously, you know, e Eastern Europe sort of plays something of a, of a role in terms of that number. Uh, second one, uh, we made a U.K. pension contribution, I think, of about $25 million. It's a relatively small number in the overall year, but in a, in a two-month quarter, it, it obviously has a disproportionate impact. Um, and then in addition to that, the soda stream business was, uh, was a little bit soft. That, that was a bit of a factor. And recall, we, we report soda stream through Europe because that's the biggest market for, uh, for the soda stream business. Thank you. Our next question comes from Camilla Garjawala with Credit Suisse. I think I dig into if I could, if I could dig into the guidance increase a little bit, a little bit. Um, um, better volume, better, better price this quarter, of course. Um, are, your um, are your expectations the same volume, price, price dynamic as we go through the rest of the year, or is it, or is it you, just you, you just kind of push, you just including the volume upside for this quarter as, as part of your full year? Thanks. Thanks. There was a lot of echo there, but if I understand, um, your question was around um, our volume pricing uh, guidance. Uh, you know. Uh, We've uh, raised the guidance on top, uh, top line because we, we've seen better elasticities in the first part of the year. We, our, our assumptions for the balance of the year are a bit more conservative on elasticities because, as I said earlier, within the context for the uh, consumer might change, might not change. We're going to obviously try to do our best with our commercial plans and our people on the ground with execution and, and better insights to minimize Elasticity is obviously, that's our role here, but um, our assumptions going forward are a little bit more conservative because we think that the consumer will be feeling uh, the overall inflation in their, in their disposable income, and, and that might have an impact on the elasticities of our categories as well. Although we think that our categories are, you know, normally fare quite well in inflationary and recessionary moments. And that's why we feel optimistic about raising the, the guidance to 8%, you know, on top of a very, you know, a very high fast growth, 9.5% uh, last year. So clearly uh, we're, we're, growing, we're growing very fast as a company. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kevin Grundy with Jefferies. Great. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I had a question on pricing as well, but uh, from a different angle, R really from a retailer's perspective. So, you know, the, the context, of course, your portfolio is in very large, essential, and high-velocity categories that drive foot traffic for retailers. But looking at results in the syndicated data, your price mix is up, you know, anywhere from low double digits to mid-teens in your larger categories. I know that's not all frontline pricing. Some of it's mixed. But nevertheless, 
certainly not inconsequential for the, for the consumer to cope with. So my question is, you know, have the pricing discussions started to become more difficult with retailers, you know, particularly your large customers, to the point where, you know, maybe we're closer to a tipping point where it's going to be more difficult to put the pricing through, or is the pricing window still very much open in your view? Uh, so your thoughts there would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah. It's an, uh, the, um, we always make full commercial plan discussions with our customers, and we try to create value for both, and, you know, those joint business planning are the essence of our growth strategy. So we do that in, in you know, in full coordination with our partners, trying to uh, make sure that we keep the consumer with us, we keep the shopper, you know, coming to the stores, and, and it's a win-win proposition. So we'll, we'll do it. We've been doing it the same this year, of course, even with more intensity uh, than in the past and more insights and more value discussions. And, and we plan to continue to do that as we go into the second half of the year and uh, into the coming years. Um, obviously, we're all concerned about, uh, you know, elasticities and, and, and consumer reaction. So it is to our both interest to take this into consideration as we as we build the commercial plant. There's, there's some, you know, there, there's some geographies in the world where um, it's, you know, these discussions are a bit more, Tactical, I would say some of the uh, European markets, there's a bit more uh, friction uh, when it comes to pricing. And, you know, actually some of our net revenue in Q1 reflects some of these uh, conversations and, and difficult uh, re- realities. I would say in, in, in the majority of the markets, these are done in collaboration with our customers and in very good value creation, win-win uh, discussions. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bob Ottenstein with Evercore. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could please uh, remind us, uh, you know, what your exposure is to China, uh, what you're seeing there now, and, uh, you know, your long-term plans. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Hey, Robert, it's you. Uh, Low single digits on on revenue and very low single digits on uh, on Nobit. Is uh, is the number. In in terms of our plans, I I think we continue to uh, to execute in the marketplace. We we own the snack business. We uh, we have a bottler in in China who we've had a very successful relationship with. And I obviously in what's a a challenging environment, uh, we'll continue to to do what we can to uh, to continue to to operate well. So, but low single digits and very low singles on on the number. Yeah, I would say the, um, obviously we're seeing uh, the impact of the lockdowns in Shanghai and some other cities impacting somehow the consumer behavior. Uh, in general, I would say the uh, in-home consumption is going up. There's been some stocking of our food business in the last uh, few weeks. Um, a little bit of uh, lower mobility in the uh, in the away from home channel, which is impacting mostly the beverage business overall. Business performing uh, as planned, um, and obviously we're, we're doing business contingency planning to make sure that we're ready in case some, some of the lockdowns impact our operating uh, plans. Now, but um, you know, in general, I would say yeah, the team is, is responding very well, and so far we haven't seen an impact in our business, which, as you said, is is relatively small compared to the uh, to the full size of the company. And just to build on Ramon's point, I, I should have mentioned as well, our guide doesn't uh, include a, a level of conservatism and, and an expectation that performance will be somewhat challenged based on the, the situation there. Thank you. Our next question comes from Steve Powers with Deutsche Bank. Good morning. Good morning, Ramon and Hugh. Um, just a quick follow-up for me, actually, going back to Lauren's question. Um, on Russia, Ukraine. Hugh, you mentioned uh, the, the contribution there at low single digits, which I think is a profit perspective. Um, on revenue, I thought it was more like mid single digits. I think, I think around four and a half percent last year. So I guess in that context, um, just can you talk about how Russia, Ukraine factors into that eight percent organic outlook? Because intuition would say um, that the business reductions there create a drag on organic growth that you're absorbing in that eight percent. But then again, there's just like there's so much nominal inflation in those markets, I'm not exactly sure how or whether Russia-Ukraine net out as a positive or a negative driver of organic growth as you calculate it uh, into what magnitude. So just some clarity there would be helpful. Thank you. 
Sure, happy to. Uh, your, your, your thoughts are, are right. Last year, uh, Russia was about four. Um, obviously, with, with the, the, the current environment, we expect it to be less than that. That's, that's my low single digit comment. Um, and yeah, we, 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 it's incorporated into our guidance. We don't expect the business to, to deliver a lot of growth this year, given, given all of the challenges and the decisions we've made. Uh, and it is, in fact, in, incorporated so that we, we've captured that as a part of the aid. So, um, yeah, I, again, without getting into a ridiculous level of detail, and I, clearly that the business is, is going to be uh, lower than it was in, the, in 2021 by a, by a meaningful amount. Thank you. Our next question comes from Nick Modi with RBC Capital Markets. Hey, good morning, guys. This is Filippo Falorni, also Nick. Um, a question on um, your beverage alcohol strategy. Maybe if you can comment on how the Hard Mountain Dew launch is performing in the States uh, where you've launched a product, and then more longer term and bigger picture, like uh, give us an update on kind of your expectations for the beverage alcohol uh, category and any potential uh, new launches or, or initiatives there. Yeah, um, this is Ramon. Yeah, listen, uh, I, I think we're testing and learning uh, at, at a fast speed, right? Both um, Boston Beer Company is learning how to market and and uh, improve the products in, in their responsibility in the partnership. We're also learning about how to um, distribute and sell low alcohol beverages, which obviously have a lot of restrictions at the state, <clears throat> even municipality level. We're having to train our people um, the right way and so on. So there's a lot of test and learning, very encouraging learnings, actually, uh, as we're seeing the consumers. Um, obviously, you know, Mountain Dew is a, is a big brand and it's generating a lot of excitement. Uh, there's a lot of initial trial. Uh, as always in these circumstances, is you know, we have to wait and see repeats and see really where, where, where the business stabilizes. But, I would say good learnings for the organization. It's still very early in the process of building the infrastructure and the uh, the talent base, uh, and pretty good pretty good response from the consumer. Um, yes, we're going to continue to uh, try to create new exciting products that will go through this platform in the future. And uh, as we learn more about the consumer, together with our partners, we'll be able to I think innovate meaningfully in this category. But uh, as I said, too early too early yet to uh, to call it a, uh, a, a huge success. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brett Cooper with Consumer Edge Research. Good morning. I uh, was just hoping you could update us on, on where you are on digitizing your relationship with customers who became consumers, aspirations on both levels, and then I guess if I can nest underneath the consumer, um, if there's any challenges you guys have in going direct uh, given independent bottling contracts. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's it's a uh, bread is a journey that we started very quite some years ago, um, both on the um, on the consumer and the and the customer. Um, I would say different levels of uh, progress in different parts of the world, uh, probably U.S. and uh, Western Europe more advanced when it comes to uh, consumer interaction. Um, the way we can um, kind of target our messaging in a much more um, granular way, and we make good progress. How we're doing that, how we're making our media much more efficient by targeting better. So that, that's, a, uh, that's an important uh, progress. The same with retailers, where you know, obviously we have platforms that uh, are fully digitalized and allow our retailers to buy from us directly. Um, and we're, you know, especially smaller customers, fragmented trade around the world. That's a platform that we are we're benefiting both for better service and also some, some productivity, being able to target the, the uh, retailer better. So progress, good progress across is strategically a very important part of our, uh, of our journey, trying to both generate additional growth through personalization, through, uh, you know, targeting the consumer, and, and, and that's a journey through innovation, through uh, new digital tools, through better uh, learning of our training of our people, our marketeers, our you know, our leaders in the in the marketplace. So it's, it's a journey. Uh, I would say in emerging markets, we're a bit behind. 
but it's, it's an investment that we're putting in place, part of our large investment in digitalization that we've been talking about for uh, already a few years. Thank you. Our last question comes from Chris Carey with Wells Fargo Securities. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, so just, just two connected questions on cost and productivity, if I could. So you, you noted um, the prior outlook was for commodities to be uh, low teens. I believe that's impacted COGS, and, and the company's now tracking higher by a couple points. Um, I guess that would imply things get worse from here. Uh, can, can you just maybe help us um, with perspective on the visibility you have in commodity expectations? I understand you're locked specifically for the next few quarters, but, you know, spot exposure increases in Q4 and how you're thinking about incremental pricing in Q4. And then just connected, Ramon, I think you noted a couple times on the call that you're doubling down on productivity. Um, would you expect to be in a position to exceed the billion dollars in productivity savings target for the year, or is this just uh, more conceptual? Thanks so much. Yeah, hi, Chris. Uh, yeah, your, your, your math is right. Uh, we said low teens before, and it's, it'll be several points higher than that. Uh, in terms of what that means for uh, Q4 when we typically see pricing in the business, we're, we're still in the process of figuring out how much that will be. Um, you know, that, that's, that's sort of our normal pricing window in, uh, in the U.S. in particular. Obviously, other markets have, have different, uh, different windows. So we'll we'll see what that uh, what that looks like when we get a little bit closer to the time. Um, in terms of your uh, your second question around productivity, yeah, we we've historically said a billion dollars, and yeah, we'll be we'll be several hundred million dollars higher than that this year based on um, based on the actions that we've needed to take to try to help manage uh, a uh, a challenging inflationary environment, but one that we have pretty well under control. Okay. Um, so thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today and for the confidence you've placed in, in us with your, uh, with your investments. And we hope that you all stay uh, safe and healthy. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect and have a wonderful day.